Hey everybody, it's Chris. Got another interview for you today with a plant-based medical doctor, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. He has been around uh, a long time and, and many of you may recognize him, uh, know his face. You've seen him on other interviews and, uh, and in documentary films and whatnot, as have I. And I'm really excited to connect and, and talk to him about plant-based nutrition and his personal journey uh, into um, diet and lifestyle medicine. So, Dr. Montgomery, thanks so much for taking the time. Looks like you're streaming live from a hospital uh, or clinic. Yes, <laughs> so yes. I'm here in my office, our medical building here, and uh, our staff have a do not disturb sign on my uh, door here, so we should be safe. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's great to connect. And uh, so I'd love to start with your, with your journey, right, uh, being conventionally trained. Uh, and my understanding after talking to many, many doctors is there's virtually no training in nutrition uh, in med school. And and so did you have a background in nutrition? What what happened in your life to make you think a little bit differently or to open up to nutrition? Yeah, well, first of all, there was no background in nutrition in my uh, formal training, my medical school training or, or residency. And I actually, I actually think of that as a benefit. I think that was a good thing because had we received training, it would have been um, uh, the wrong training. And so, um, you know, the, the medical education institution is, is compromised, and, and I'll kind of get into that maybe a little bit later. But, but you know, my background, you know, I wanted to be a doctor. I knew that since the ninth grade, um, and I never, you know, you know, thought about it again. And then I went into um, in total medicine, uh, I made that decision when I was in medical school. In fact, I knew I wanted to be a cardiologist between my first and second year of medical school based on some research experience I had then. And so, again, that led me to the track of internal medicine and cardiology training. And then during my, during my internal medicine train training, I knew I wanted to go into a sub subspecialty of cardiology called cardiac electrophysiology. So... Uh, I was blessed to be able to make these decisions early on, and so I moved right on through the course and, and received excellent training. Uh, uh, and I'll put air quotes around the word training because I'm not sure if it's even training, but we'll get to that in a minute. But to make a long story short, uh, I went through my you know training career, and immediately after my career, so and, and just to, so that your audience, and know, audience knows, um, you, know, you of course you do your four years of undergrad, then you do four years of medical school. Then I did um, three years of internal medicine training. That's one year residency, two years of one year of internship, two years of residency, and then I did uh, four years of a combined general cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology training. And so after that, I went to private practice, uh, and I never worked for anyone. I went into practice. Um, Immediately after my training, hung up my shingles and just started seeing patients. I'm here in Houston, and uh, I was working in and around the world's largest medical center. So I had hospital privileges at somewhere between 11 and 15 hospitals around Houston and some of the surrounding areas. So needless to say, I was extremely busy uh, just starting my business. I just got married maybe a year and a quarter prior to coming out of training. And then, you know, within about a year or two uh started having kids so just a very very busy lifestyle as a young business entrepreneur practicing physician family man etc it's kind of set the context so uh i was trained in doing you know general cardiology procedures device implants which consists of minor surgical procedures with implants catheter procedures complex ablations etc uh, and it was actually a good experience. You know, we saw, pa I saw patients and, and, you know, did a lot of good for people who were acutely ill, uh, you know, implanted devices that would save patients' lives and, and the like. Uh, I would take the emergency room call and so on. During that time, in the back of my mind, uh, I had an interest in wellness. And I think that interest in wellness started during my cardiology training. You know, we had a rotation during cardiac rehab, and I remember doing, you know, sitting in a cardiac rehab facility, and patients would come and they'd walk on the treadmill and they talk to nutritionists, etc. And I said, you know, I'd like to have this in my practice. I didn't know exactly what it meant beyond that, but I had a desire to do that. So um, as I moved through my training and seeing patient after patient, the big difference in in being in private practice and being in training is that in private practice, you develop a longitudinal perspective of your patients. So for example, 
In training, I may go from one rotation to the other. And granted, we did have our continuity care clinic, but it, was, it wasn't the dominant part of our practice, our, our training. So it was always a consult here, there, and so on. In my private practice, my patients became almost like family members. So I saw a patient year after year, and so two years, three years, four years. And one thing I noticed that despite the improvement in technology, you know, improved medications and the like, uh, my patients were getting sicker and sicker. Uh, you know, device implants became better, medications and so on. So that was something that stuck out. Then, of course, the other thing I noticed, my health wasn't the best. My cholesterol was going up. I was gaining weight, pressure was up. And then I had a number of life uh, uh, issues and my mother had taken ill. Uh, and uh, just a quick synopsis of that, she, you know, had diabetes and high blood pressure, chronic, was on a lot of medications. And she met her demise um, with complications related to removal of a brain tumor, but she died of liver failure. And um, as I understood that process, plus looking at my own life, plus being exposed to alternative ways of medicine, i.e. some patient came in being treated by herbalists and all, I would visit some of these uh, alternative practitioners. It led me to start reading uh, outside of the medical literature and in the lay press. And as I read through these things, I started reading about different things. You know, this herb, this supplement, this vitamin, this nutrient. There was a common denominator was, you know, a healthy diet. And the common denominator of a healthy diet was plant foods, fruits and vegetables. So your healthy diet, uh, this herb, this snake oil, you know, potion, plus healthy fruits and vegetables and exercise, you know, would help you improve whatever condition. So as I read through things and experimented with things, et cetera, I took a raw vegan chef course. I don't remember how it came about that, but I took this course. It was a crash course. I became a certified raw vegan chef uh, over the weekend. And during that course, I learned about a lot of resources, one of which was a gentleman named John Rose, who's here in the Houston area. And he was known for coaching people on juice feeds and detox. He was a master of that. So I, I met with him and we met and we talked in a Whole Foods for about, I don't know, four or five hours, some lengthy period of time. And this guy knew everything about food singing. So I decided to take his juice feast class. I did for 33 days. He coached me through a juice feast. And I just felt amazing. I, I, at that time, I was somewhere around 37 years old, maybe something like that, 37, 38-ish. Uh, and I felt like I was 18. Uh, in fact, no, I wasn't 38. I was 39, almost 40. Uh, but I felt like I was 18. And so um, it was an amazing experience. And after I finished this, I started saying, well, I can eat a vegan diet. This is pretty easy because, you know, 38, 33 days of not eating anything, uh, you know, just regular vegan food looked delicious. Uh, so the course of my early life and using this, diet, uh, I noticed that there was a spectrum within vegan, those vegan junk food and vegan health and stuff. Every year I did one or two juice feeds and I recognized the difference. That led me down a course of creating a food classification system and the like. But the other main point that I want to make um, in, in this commentary is that when I started, when I experienced this myself, I then started applying it to patients seven days, another seven days, 10 days, etc. And I would write out salad recipes, sometimes juice recipes. And I just saw amazing changes in some of the sickest patients around in a very short period of time. The kinds of patients I saw were not just patients coming in with just a little high cholesterol who want to lose weight. These were people who were extremely ill. They had just come out of the hospital. They probably need to go to the hospital. They had hearts beating at 10%. They just had bypass surgery, et cetera. I put them on a detox diet, and in a week's time, they had amazing improvements. There was one patient I, I, I put on a detox regimen. It was on life support. It happened to be a, a small, long-term acute care hospital that I was a medical director at the time. I gave a, 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 a superfood powder mixed with water in a peg tube, weaned them off all the, the other parental nutritions as well as the medications progressively, and that patient, she walked out of the hospital. So I just saw amazing things at one amazing event after the other. And I had I decided at that point 
I have to figure out how to integrate this into my practice. Well, and you must have uh, had uh, significant changes in your own health when you did that 33 day juice feast, juice fast, right? I mean, you're, I yes. imagine your cholesterol went down, you lost weight, blood pressure went down. What was that like? Yes. Yeah, that was great. So, you know, my cholesterol at the time, my LDL cholesterol, I think was around 138 uh, in that range. And I had done other diets because then I was experimenting with things. And I was a, a internal medicine physician who had um, an internal medicine geriatric practice where she would put uh, her clients on this very low calorie diet. And uh, it's 500 calories a day. So I, I you know, went on this regimen and I lost a lot of weight, but the LDL cholesterol didn't budge. Mm. So it was, uh, it was a weight loss, uh, uh, effective in weight loss, but the biochemistry of my body did not improve. And that's one thing I've noticed about a plant-based nutritional regimen versus other types of nutritional regimen. There are many ways of losing weight, but the biochemistry of how your body changes is extremely important. And that makes the difference when you're looking at heart failure, cancer, diabetes, other inflammatory conditions, because the biochemistry has to change. It's not just a matter of weight loss. In fact, when I talk to my patients, I talk very little about weight loss. I don't even mention weight loss. It doesn't matter if they're morbidly obese or not, because I'm not shooting for weight loss necessarily. I'm shooting for the optimal nutrition first and foremost. That's going to give them the optimal biochemical and physiological change. That's going to result in things normalizing, including optimal weight. Yeah, the weight comes off if you get the yes. diet right and lifestyle practices dialed in. Yes. So let, let's talk about cholesterol. Okay. Um, I know for many years, there was a, seemed to be a general consensus that uh, high cholesterol was not a good thing mm -hmm. and that it contributed to heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease. And then it seems like in the last maybe five or 10 years, there's been this big pushback uh, and mainly among people who are very heavy meat eaters, uh, mm -hmm. paleo and keto and uh, uh, carnivore type uh, in advocates who uh, are basically trying to say, no, your cholesterol is great. Cholesterol doesn't matter. High cholesterol is fine. You know, um, and I'd love for you to weigh in on this. Yeah, that's a great point. I listen to uh, uh, different uh podcasts and YouTube channels that some people who push, you know, the, the uh, this protein, the animal protein based diets, um, of, of note, many of them uh, have been a little bit quiet given some of the data in the recent uh, pandemic uh, related to high protein diet versus high animal protein diet versus the plant based diet, because there was some problems with the high protein, uh, animal protein diet. But, but to weigh in on the cholesterol, here, here's my take on it in general. Um, when we look at one biomarker, I don't care if it's cholesterol or C-reactive protein or whatever the case may be, uh, you're just looking at one biomarker. And that one biomarker is gonna be abnormal for perhaps a number of reasons. And yes, in cardiology, we traditionally look at high LDL cholesterol being a major risk factor for, for cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular death. And it's one of those things that we put a lot of emphasis in with, you know, certain medications, get the LDL down, et cetera. But, you know, there's been some data showing that, you know, looking at uh, reduction in LDL uh, hasn't had as strong of an impact on survival and look at meta-analysis and stuff as we initially thought. But, but even that, from my standpoint, is not so important because when I look at an abnormal lipid profile, I think of it in the context of abnormal metabolism and abnormal hepatic or abnormal liver function. I like to think of it that way as opposed to saying, well, your LDL cholesterol is high, you must get it down to prevent this outcome. Uh, if you remember uh, Colin Campbell in his data in the, the uh, China study, they also saw a correlation with elevated LDL cholesterol with cancer. And, and there are other diseases. So it's not just, so LDL cholesterol, LDL, LDL cholesterol, yes, we can show that there may be a contributing factor of having all of these uh, fatty particles floating around in your blood that contributes to atherosclerosis. I'm not saying that's not the case, but you also have to consider the fact that these increased biomarkers are also a signal of underlying metabolic abnormalities. 
And to just turn the biomarker down or, or reduce the biomarker doesn't necessarily get to the core of the metabolic abnormality. You may reduce the amount of LDL cholesterol in the blood and maybe you don't have as much you know, plaque in the arteries, but the biochemical and physiological abnormality is still there, especially from the standpoint of the liver, because if your, 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 your cholesterol metabolism is off, that means biochemical reactions are not happening that should happen. And so there's a, if there's an imbalanced biochemistry and you need to get back balanced. And so instead of just using a drug to get that one number down, we need to step back and look at a process that's going to bring the body into biochemical balance. That number will come down naturally, but what's, it's coming down because the biochemical process is normalizing, not because you're forcing one biochemical reaction, but not affecting trillions of others. That makes sense. And, and there's two, two, Two contributor, major contributors to high cholesterol, obviously eating it is one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When you're eating animal food, you're eating cholesterol. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other is your liver is producing cholesterol as, a, right. as that's part of normal liver function. So you're, what you're saying is uh, abnormal liver function, uh, suboptimal metabolic function, whatever, uh, that can trigger a person's liver to just produce more cholesterol. And it's probably some kind of protective response. Do you have any thoughts on that? It could be a protective response. I mean, the body is, is making adjustments uh, in many different ways. And so, um, you know, you can call them protective, you can call them just, just ways the body will adjust. But uh, I've had situations where I have made certain medication adjustments for patients. So these are patients that come in, their cholesterol is high, they get on a plant-based diet, they're compliant, the numbers don't change away. But once I start making medication adjustments, these are medications that are cleared hepatically then the cholesterol will come down. So, so you can get, you know, improvements in cholesterol by means other than just by reducing fat or st- putting them on a cholesterol lowering drug. There are other medications you can make adjustments on. I've seen where the, the, it'll it'll come in, you know, it'll come under control. So you have to look at the total biochemistry of what's going on. That's a really good point. That I think, yeah, um, maybe it's, there are folks out there that haven't thought about this or heard about it, uh, is that they could be on a medication that could be promoting high cholesterol or a cholesterol production in the liver. That's yeah. Yeah. There's the hepatic function abnormalities is something that we don't pay enough attention to. Um, there's this condition, non-alcoholic, uh, steroid hepatitis where you have underlying liver disease that develops and someone who's not an alcoholic or who's not consuming alcohol. And so oftentimes people say, well, why is that? And, and, and frequently it's gonna be the diet, you know, processed foods, whether it's processed carbohydrates, animal proteins contribute to that because you're having to break down the nitrous compounds, uh, but medications also contribute to that. So we're consuming many chemicals in our diet Processed foods being very high, animal protein being a high contributor, but also uh, uh, medications, be they over the counter or prescription medications. So many of these things go through what's called first pass, and the liver has to to metabolize these things. And so, if you get into a situation where the liver function is overburdened, then you'll start to have hepatic cell or liver cell breakdown. And over time, the liver will become fatty, but also scarred. And, and many doctors uh, don't recognize this because oftentimes we'll look at liver enzymes. And if the liver enzymes are normal, they say their liver function fine. In fact, when, they, when patients are started on statin drugs, they say, well, follow liver enzymes, the liver enzymes are okay, then continue the statin drug. That's the problem because the statin drug can kill the liver without the liver enzymes being abnormal. Uh, and so I've seen other patients with this who had go all the way to liver uh, uh, failure, uh, cirrhosis, without significant frequent episodes of liver enzymes being abnormal. Why? Wow. Liver enzymes are frequently released when you have cells that are acutely injured and the cell membranes are disrupted. And so these enzymes go from the intracellular space into the extracellular space and into the bloodstream. And therefore you see, so maybe you get a virus that hits or, or get an acute inflammation of the liver and the enzymes will go up. And so that's a real hepatitis or some infection or whatever the case may be. However, if you have a process in which you're 
causing the, the, the liver cells slowly and progressively, they won't go through that acute injury phase, so you won't have membrane disruption necessarily. Uh, and so the enzymes in the blood will not be elevated. However, those liver cells and the liver tissue itself is being progressively damaged. So you develop scarring. So that's why we're seeing so many people with fatty liver and non-alcoholic liver cirrhosis, because we our diets and our, our, our food consumption is becoming increasingly chemicalized and processed. And we bring these things into our system. And so liver dysfunction is happening despite the fact that your doctors are following liver enzymes and they don't realize it. So in fact, what we do in my practice is we look at other parameters of liver function. So it's one thing to say, okay, a cell is acutely injured and so it's leaking enzymes. But if a cell is dysfunctional, what might happen? So the liver does important things such as make protein. So we will look at uh, albumin level, and I'll look at what's called a, a PTNINR. These are uh, a coagulation profiles, and and they they're important for uh, 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 many reasons, but they're made through the liver. So if I have a patient on so many medications, and I see that PTNINR is elevated, meaning they're not making a specific type of enzymes to normalize that coagulation profile, that makes me suspicious that there's some liver dysfunction. I also check ammonia levels, which, you know, fluctuate more rapidly than PTNINR, but it also is another sign. So we look at these parameters in someone who's on a lot of medication or someone who I'm, I'm suspecting have hepatic dysfunction, I'll follow these parameters uh, as opposed to just rely on liver enzymes. What are some of your favorite stories to tell about patients who have come to you in, in very ill health and seeing them turn around with a plant-based diet? Yeah, that's uh, there are a lot to tell. Um, one of my earliest stories I tell frequently is a lady who came in and um, she was, I think, in her 60s. <clears throat> and um, she um, had, I think, four vessel bypass surgery, maybe five, six years prior to that time. She'd had stent placements uh, maybe within a year or two prior to that time after the bypass surgery. Despite that, her heart was beating at 10%. Uh, and she had just been discharged from the hospital at the time I saw her for the first time as a referral, cardiology referral. And so her husband wheeled her in. She was a diabetic. She had um, uh, bad knee. Uh, she had had uh, knee surgery, so she couldn't walk. And then uh, she was on oxygen and, you know, elected a medication list. She was on 21 medications. And, and so, you know, she, her head was down and so on. So I looked at her and uh, I thought to myself, uh, hmm, goodness, um, what am I going to do at medication 22, 23, 24? And so, you know, I thought about it and I asked her, I said, do you have a juicer? And so and the husband said, yes, we have a juicer. I said, great. So this is what I want you to do. So I wrote down some juicing recipes and I said, oh, okay, for the next 10 days, I don't want you to eat anything. I want you to juice and drink cold pressed juices, use these recipes. So they pull out the juice and I called them throughout that time. And um, we had weaned some medications also over the phone. She came back in 10 days, walking, talking, laughing, no oxygen and feeling like a new friend. That's just 10 days, okay? Um, the other story I told you about, alluded to earlier is a patient uh, who was uh, in the hospital. She was a patient whom I had been treating for some time, uh, maybe several years. She had chronic obstructive lung disease. Uh, she had congestive heart failure and I had a a defibrillator in her. And she was admitted to an acute care hospital short term with, uh, I think it was maybe an infection. I don't remember the details, decompensated heart failure. Then she was transferred to the LTAC, a long-term acute care hospital where patients go to spend a longer period of time before they recover. Her condition started to worsen at that time. And in fact, she, her kidney started to fail. Uh, and my uh, nephrology colleague uh, went to the family and said, look, we need to start on dialysis. And they said, no, we don't want to start on dialysis. Uh, you know, we'd rather die. And some people are nervous about dialysis. So when I found out about that, I talked to the family and I said, you know what, hold on, uh, I want to try something. Now, I happen to be the medical director. It was a very small hospital. I was the medical director at the time, so I had a lot of ability to do these things. 
So what I did is I started, and this is when I was in early my phases of doing plant-based diet and these things. So there was a superfood, which was freeze-dried greens, all organic, had wheatgrass and all this other stuff in it. And so I had the nurse make a concoction using this uh, powdered substance. We'd mix it with maybe two thick scoops, maybe it was about three or four tablespoons equivalent, and mix it with about 200 mLs of water, shake it up, and then feed it through her peg tube. We did that about, I don't know, four to six times a day. That was her food. And what I then did, I just stopped all of the parental feeds through the IV that she was getting. Uh, and then I started progressively weaning her medication. Now, during this time, she went through an amazing detox reaction. The um, respiratory therapists were really working hard to keep up with the suction because she was making copious amounts of mucus coming out of her lungs. Now, she had chronic lung disease. And frequently, people detox, they start to remove toxins from some of the you know, uh, tissues that were you know, most harmed. And so, in this case, which is reminiscent of someone who stopped smoking. Anyone who's ever in the audience who's ever smoked for a long time and stopped, they will they will um, cough more early after they stop smoking. Frequency of productive cough because their lungs are clearing out. This is what was going on to her. To make a long story short, her condition got so much better. I weaned off all the medication. I was I was aggressively weaning medication. I knew the medication contributed to things. She was somewhat. Um, her mental status was 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 severely uh, impaired, but as I weaned the medications, her liver function got better and she woke up. Then we were able to wean her off the ventilator as her lungs cleared up, and she got to the point where she walked out of the hospital. So this is somebody who's on death's door on a ventilator whom we detox and wean. And we've had other situations very similar now. I wish I can do um, a case series. And one of these days, I, I will. I plan to. I'll figure out the right setting. Uh, because I know patients in this acute uh, uh, setting can turn around. Another more recent example was a patient of mine who had congestive heart failure. And so she was admitted to the hospital. I admitted her. She had a severely impaired mitral valve. It was leaking a lot. And uh, she also had um, inflammatory, she had uh, systemic lupus, I think. And so she was having some flares and intermittent flares. Uh, so I met her for controlling of her heart failure. She's decompensated heart failure. So you put her in for diuretics. We also started her uh, on some steroids and admitted to kind of calm down her inflammation. So I consulted one of my cardiology colleagues who dealt with structural heart, and they were considering putting a mitral valve clip to reduce the regurgitation. Uh, he saw her, she had been in the ICU, the CCU rather, and she had a number of problems. And he said, look, she's too ill. We can't do anything for her. Uh, we are going to just, you know, you just need to put her in the hospital and let her go. I talked to another colleague of mine who um, was doing some of my um, uh, uh, electrophysiology procedures because I, I hadn't done procedures in about four to five years and so focusing more on wellness. Uh, and so she saw the other my other colleague's note and said, well, there's nothing I can do for her. So anyway, here I had this patient. We, you know, she was on a melanone drip, which is a medication that heart failure patients get kind of last stage. So we got her out, we're able to get her out of the CCU. And so the palliative care team came. So well, let's just put her in hospital. We tried to put her in hospital. They couldn't keep her because of the melanoma drip. So then she was back in the hospital on melanoma drip. And so they said, well, look, we'll have to stop the melanoma drip and let you die here. So when I saw the patient, she was crying and so on. I said, look, hold on. Uh, we're going to do something. We're going to get you out of the hospital and get you better. So I put her on, on a detox raw smoothies. Uh, and uh, super green smoothies. It was like one fruit and the rest greens. We had a blue green algae. We had some with wheatgrass components in it. Uh, and that's all she did for seven days. I was able to wean off the melanoma. She actually, her, her blood pressure got better. Her overall circulation, hemodynamics got better. And she walked out of the hospital. She actually did well even after, was able to exercise and do things like that. So here's somebody who was too sick to be operated on who then only thing there was was nutrition. One last example was another elderly gentleman, 79, wasn't too old. Uh, he came in with a heart attack. He had had a history of blood clots and pulmonary emboli and the like. And, um, and he had not been too compliant as an outpatient with my regimen, but 
He had a, a heart attack in an outside hospital. They tried to send him for emergency surgery. The family contacted me and we got him to my hospital. I talked to my surgical colleague and we both decided to wait and observe him. We gave him some intravenous heparin and see how he did. He went, he left the hospital against medical advice only to get sicker and come back within about 24, 36 hours. And so his heart pumping function was weaker. His acid levels had built up. And the surgeon says, no, we're going to touch him. Now, he was in the throes of a heart attack. That was the, my interventional colleagues as well. I can't really do anything. He's got multivessel disease. So I talked to the family and said, look, we're going to have to just detox him. And so, again, the same thing. He had smoothies plus raw food. And we get food sent from our restaurant on site. Uh, so the family picked up the food. We gave him a, a couple of supplements, but really it was the food. He stabilized and, again, was able to leave the hospital. So someone in, you know, massive heart attack, et cetera, uh, it was the food that made the difference. And I, I gave these uh, examples large because even in the plant-based community, uh, the thinking is that, well, if you're acutely ill, that's too late, okay? You have to do the surgery, et cetera. It's not too late. If somebody's in the throes of acute illness, yes, they, they may need emergency stent or bypass. But sometimes these people are so ill, they, they're not even candidates for that. I have other examples. People are so ill, they're not candidates for these interventions. So the only thing you have is the food. So the food prescription, as we you know refer to it, in a, a raw diet in a detox fashion, is the way these patients can turn around. I love those stories. They're amazing. Uh, just absolutely remarkable. I mean, taking someone out of hospice, turning their health around with nutrition and detoxification and raw food. I mean, that, that to me, those are the stories that need to be told that, uh, you know, people just don't even know. They, they are so hopeless in, in many cases and their doctors are, the doctors they're talking to don't have any solutions for them. And they just kind of shrug their shoulders and say like, well, you're dying and that's it, you know? Yeah. Yep. And have you had much pushback from your colleagues about the things that you do about nutrition? Well, you know, it's a, a great question. Um, I, well, I frequently start off the answer by saying, I don't know what they say behind my back. <laughs> but here's the thing. I, it's, it, I don't get a lot of pushback in many ways. There have been some situations um, there was one situation I was trying to put a patient on a raw detox diet and one of the dietitians made a fuss and there was some email fights back and forth between the medical director and hospital myself. And, you know, I, I lost that battle and unfortunately lost the patient. But other than that one example, I've been able to, uh, I think, maneuver uh, below, below the radar. But also uh, many of my colleagues have been somewhat receptive, even though they may not have dealt, uh, delved into trying to understand what I do, but they, they recognize the results. I have some colleagues who refer patients to me who they know need aggressive lifestyle changes. So I think there's been at the very least a warm reception. And I think people recognize it. Now, um, I say that in large part, I had the benefit of working two decades and being entrenched within the system and gaining their I guess, respect, trust as an insider. And then this insider all of a sudden starts applying this different approach. So it's like, well, you know, what happened to, you know, Montgomery, he's, he was doing this and now he's doing that. And, you know, we have, we've published our results in the medical literature. We continue to do work to do more research. Uh, and so uh, the, um, the scientific validation of what we're doing and the clinical uh, of benefit. And, and we've had benefit of patients, thousands of patients, thousands of patients, you know, over, you know, nearly about a two year, two decade period. So um, it's hard to argue with the, the actual evidence and the facts. So even though I, I don't see my colleagues, you know, wholeheartedly embracing this approach, I, I definitely don't get noticeable pushback and, and uh, there seems to be some support in terms of doctors referring patients who may think need aggressive lifestyle changes. So you said two decades. So I guess you started this journey of 20 years ago, started treating patients this way about 20 years ago. Pretty close. Just say 19, yeah. -ish, 18 and a half, 19 years ago. And so, yeah, it's when I did that juice feast and I had those changes, I said, wait a minute, this is 
this is something different. And I started applying to patients. And at that time, you know, in my practice, I was just, you know, I, I didn't have any of the infrastructure that I have now. Uh, so I would see a patient, I would write down, you know, a salad recipe, you know, and, and what have it, and I would give it to them, and then I would type it on the computer. So I started building these collection recipes just one at a time. I would think, okay, let's make this salad dressing this way, do this, and I would write it down, I'd type it out. Uh, and as I figured out different recipes, I would write them out, type them out, and I created a collection. So patient one would have two or three, patient number 10 would have, say, 15 or 20, because I'd build on those recipes I've given subsequent patients. And so from that, you know, evolved a booklet of recipes and approaches. And as I went from one patient to the next, uh, the process was developed. And what happened was um, in 2008, uh, and I was working as a, as a member of the advisory committee for one of the big device companies at the time. And, and they were doing some things with each of their members of their local media. So the, the local Fox News um, had arranged to come and do an interview with me on um, the issue of uh, sudden cardiac death in athletes. So they came to my office and had the cameraman and everything. And so to make a long story short, we uh, talked about that, we did the interview, and while they were waiting for me to come, uh, the anchor person was talking to one of my staff and they shared with them about all the other things we did for patients in terms of the diabetes and the like. And so the anchor person was interested in that. So after we did this interview, she said, well, can we come back? This was in August when I did this interview of 08, so can we come back in October and do a story on that? And so they did. And uh, they asked us to bring uh, two patients. And in fact, we had forgotten about it to the day of, and we called some people last minute who came. And to make a long story short, they did, it was a great interview. They put together a great story. Uh, and that story went viral. They, they uh, put the recorded uh, story on twice that week. And it was actually the week that, uh, of Obama's first election uh, victory uh, and acceptance speech. And then that, so that Thursday after, that Wednesday election day, we uh, found out, uh, they aired it again, and then that Friday I did a, a live interview on air. That story went viral by the time I got back to my office from the studio, you know, all of our phones were let up. Now at that time, we didn't have a website. We were talking about putting the website up. I mean, just imagine, not even having a website. No, not to mention social media, we didn't have any of those things. But to make long story short, um, we got a lot of phone calls and a big interest came. And that's when we started developing programs around wellness at that point because the demand for that came that just rose. And so that got us to the next tier. And we've subsequently had other situations where, you know, uh, the um, we were elevated to a new level of, of uh, recognition. And um, we started putting more systems in place and so on. We develop uh, through these boot camp classes, wellness memberships and the like. And it was that through this um, community, if you will, that we developed early community that the members started saying, look, you know, we like the recipes you give us, but we don't have time to make them. We want to buy the food. And so when they said that, we had to get into the restaurant business. And so one thing led to another. And now we have a restaurant now, a grocery store, a nutrition center in, in our medical facility. And we're expanding that. We ship food around the country and the like. And what's it called? Garden Kitchen. Uh, and the, the website is gardenkitchenfoodsplural.com. Gardenkitchenfoods.com. Yeah. We're updating the website as we speak. And so in the, um, say, I'm thinking by uh, a couple of months from the time this airs, uh, we'll have a new website up. But the old website gives you an introduction to what we do and has a menu on there. We've updated the menu a number of times. And uh, the new website will have our meal plans and ordering and the like. We've had people call in to our center and order food. There's one recent story of a gentleman who's on a heart transplant list. He was in a hospital somewhere in North Carolina. And uh, he's on a heart transplant unit, advanced heart failure unit. And he was being told he needs a, a left ventricular assist device or LVAD in preparation for heart transplant. So he, he looked us up and uh, he called my integrated care coordinator, uh, Jackie, and uh, arranged to get food shipped from our restaurant to the hospital. 
And so we shipped food to the hospital. He was able to get discharged and we were shipping food to his house. And so that's how people, they, they reach us by a number of different means. So he wasn't even a patient. He was just, he just started eating the food. And I like that story because it, it does start with the food and it's really a critical factor. Once you get your body to start to heal itself, then the body does the most important work that needs to be done. Seems like a lot of doctors have a um, sort of an attitude that, you know, it doesn't matter what I tell the patients, they're not going to change. They're not going to quit smoking. They're not going to change their diet, that kind of thing. In your experience, how receptive are patients to change when you tell them you need to change your diet? Yeah. I mean, I imagine, and let me, before you answer, sure. let me at least, I imagine now they're very receptive because they come to you knowing that's probably what they're going to be told. Yeah. But in the early days before you had established yourself in this way, what was it like? Was it hard to convince people to change? Did most of them not change or how did that, how did that go? That's a great question. And, you know, the interesting thing, yes, we do have a skewed population, but we still get a fair number of people who need some convincing, but certainly in the early days, you know, it's interesting. The early days, um, is when you think about it, so well, it's probably easier now because, you know, people are skewed. They come for that in the early days, it must have been harder. But there was some advantage to the early days, too, because in the early days, this whole concept uh, wasn't, you know, as uh, known or, or, or popular, if you will. I mean, now there are many documentaries and lots of people know about plant-based eating, et cetera. So uh, there was a little bit of mystery behind it. And so that unknown factor can work both for and against me to a certain extent. Um, so in the early days, I, I'm, I'm just thinking back, I don't recall there being a major challenge. For example, uh, our approach was one where we would have people take very aggressive changes for a short period of time. Uh, I wasn't telling people to say, okay, let's make moderation and change, let's cut back, let's do this. And I didn't say, well, go vegan for the rest of your life. What I did is I say, eat just these salads for the next seven to 10 days and come back, we'll talk about it. Oh, do another seven days. Do another. And during that time in the patient's mind, it's okay, I have to do this for seven days, do this for 10 days, let me see how I do. In that short period of time, they're feeling much better. And then I say, okay, give me another seven or 10 days, et cetera. So during that time, the patients were getting some return benefit. So that was a psychological component to that. Yes, and so it 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 made it easier in many ways. So we often think, that, well, it's too hard, raw. Nobody can do this. It's too hard, and to some extent, there's some truth to it. There's some challenges to going all raw compared to not. However, when you're very critically ill or acutely ill, and you make major changes, it can have a big impact. I'm not saying everybody sticks with it, and I'm not saying everybody complies. But it giving people a high challenge uh, to get a, a the raw diet, a more aggressive approach, it also gave them a more aggressive return and a faster benefit. And in my opinion, that's easier to do than say take baby steps. When you're taking baby steps, you get nowhere. I mean, why don't you go for a hike, five mile hike, and just take little one inch baby steps? And see if you don't turn around and go back home before you get, you know, one city block, let alone one mile. I mean, baby steps wear you out and you make little to no part. In fact, with nutrition, uh, it's my thinking that your baby steps get you nowhere. So if I say, okay, somebody likes to eat fried chicken three days, a, uh, three times a day, seven days a week. And I say, well, why don't you cut back and eat fried chicken just two days a week? They say, okay, I can do that. And so for five days, they do a healthy diet and then, they get benefits in those two days eat fried chicken. They re reverse all the benefits of the five days they eat healthy. But then the two days they eat fried chicken, they only reinforce the desire to eat fried chicken seven days. So they keep doing that. They're getting no progress, but yet they're, they're maintaining their craving for fried chicken. So they're miserable without making progress. So if I wanted to be cruel and evil and torture somebody, I would say take baby steps and let's do it in moderation. And I'll sit back and <laughs> laugh at you. <laughs> I, that's such an it's such powerful insight right there, and and we agree because I often say massive action produces massive results. 
That's right. Right. Massive action and go, radically changing your diet from a standard American diet, high in animal food and processed food, fast food, junk food. Going from that to all raw mm -hmm. or to a juice fast is massive dietary action. It's a huge right. change. And you're right. There is a not just the physiological benefit and that which people usually feel very quickly. You know, the first few days are kind of hard and you usually feel like crap. Mm -hmm. That's but right. then once you get past day three or four, mm -hmm. right around that time, you know, fifth day, something like that, you start to feel pretty good. That's right. Most folks that's, start to feel pretty good. And then, exactly and then right. that mo momentum picks up and then they feel better and better. And by day seven or 10, like on a juice fast or raw food, mm -hmm. yeah, they really start to feel good. And so they got the physiological thing, but then they've also got, like you said, that psychological benefit of one, I can do this, right? I am doing right. it. That's right. That's right. And I'm, I can tell it's working. It's helping me. So I love that you're, you're giving people this sort of short sprint. Yep. to get to get a benefit to achieve yep. some benefit and then yep. build on it from there that's yep. such a, a smart approach and i i understand now why you've been so successful helping people change because yeah the baby steps thing right you, you'll never get there it'll just no, yeah it, it's 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 really bad plus we we see them frequently and give them lots of encouragement because you know as you said there's challenges and we walk and talk them through that which is very important and so uh, some of the common responses I get, and this is what we used to do in the boot camp class, is after week two or three, people come and say, wow, I didn't realize how easy this was. There was one story of a, a, a gentleman, we're in Houston, the barbecue capital of the world, perhaps. Uh, and um, this gentleman, he, he, uh, he, he had a business, a barbecue business. Now, he ate barbecue and sold barbecue. He had one of those large trailers on behind a truck with a huge barbecue pit and they go and do events and the like. And he had diabetes. And uh, I think uh, my recollection of the story is either he was on uh, pills and his doctor was saying, well, we need to start you on insulin or he was on the low dose insulin with increased insulin. But neither or less, he either went on insulin uh, or was told he had to increase his insulin. And I think it was supposed to go on insulin. And, and the fact is, primary care doctor said, okay, I'm going to have to put you on insulin because your numbers aren't right. He was so-called scared straight. Now, he hadn't heard about our program and the like. So he came and did our boot camp class. And this is somebody who says, hey, I can't do this. I'm not. But he was scared straight. He went through the boot camp class. At the end of the boot camp class, he sold his barbecue pits. <laughs> yeah. I had and a feeling so, that yeah. was coming. <laughs> yeah. And so, again, the psychological benefit, it, it has an impact on people. And, and there was a story where one patient I saw and tried to get her to do it. She did not follow the program. Later on, another patient I saw did the program and did very well. She had a relative, a sister, a cousin who then was influenced by her to follow the plant-based regimen. They did well. They have to be a friend of this other person whom I talked to didn't follow the regimen based on talking to me, but was influenced by the relative of the other patient, and she then started following the regimen. So it, it has effects uh, that can be cascade effects, positive cascade effects, because family members start to do, you know, follow this regimen, et cetera. At a 17 year old, started having chest pain, a weak heart. And I put him on a raw detox diet. He followed it and did it for four weeks. We, you know, helped him out, let him have some cooked foods after that. He started doing better. His family started eating better. So there's a cascade effect that can happen because, you know, people around you. Now, tell my patients, don't expect the world to change for you. Expect yourself to change the world. Uh, and, and I also tell them when they're going to family events, don't stay away from those events. Go to those events take your salad or whatever raw food you're eating and sit there in the middle of everybody else and, and live that lifestyle because people around you, your loved ones need to see that and they will ask you questions. And so these are the types of things I try to get them to understand that they're part of a bigger mission and part of a bigger uh, movement. Uh, they're being recruited for this movement and it's not only important for them to be successful for themselves, but they need to be successful for people around them. You know, what about your kids? What about your grandkids? What about your other loved ones? So it's, it's, it's all about a value proposition. And when we put this in a bigger context of a value proposition, then that piece of baked chicken and piece of, you know, 
wing or oxtail becomes less important. Uh, and, and that's what I try to help uh, uh, the patients understand. I'd love to ask you about your own personal diet. Like what, what, uh, what do you like to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And obviously you mix things up, but what's your, yeah. what's a typical day for you? What's three meals look like for you in a typical day? Yeah. So the mornings, what I try to do, and, and I especially do this on, on my workout days and even my non-workout days, but the mornings I'll, I'll try to start off with a green drink. So this morning I had, uh, we make this green drink where it's really a plant infused water. We get a, an alkaline water and we'll put like a, a liquid blue green algae and then we'll uh, juice ginger, uh, cilantro, and mint in it. And so we call it our superfood water. So I'll drink superfood water. Sometimes I'll drink coconut water. Uh, sometimes I have a cold press drink. So in the morning times I try to hydrate, you know, so I either consume beverages, raw beverages, uh, water, superfood water, uh, coconut water, etc. Then uh, I often try to consume fruit. So late I've been eating mangoes. Um, uh, early in the summer, I was consuming watermelon uh, and, uh, you know, other hydrating fruits, cantaloupe. Uh, so in the morning, I try to do, uh, well, I typically eat more hydrating foods. And in the middle part of the day is when I have my salads. And so the salads will be, you know, of course, your leafy greens and other things. Now, I may also have like a raw sandwich. So in our restaurant, we'll make, uh, we make some bread. We have a naan, a uh, raw vegan naan. We have a cinnamon bread and they're all seed-based, et cetera. So I'll make a sandwich or wrap using one of these. We make a raw pizza. So that may be like, you know, after, you know, the salad. Uh, and then later in the day, I may have another salad or, or something like that with like dehydrated food with, with some kind of beverage. Are you predominantly raw or do you eat cooked food some? Uh, the last year, for the last nearly two years, I've been all raw. Um, most of my 18 years, I've uh, been predominantly raw, so ate a high raw diet. I would say the first, let me think. Uh, the first five years of my plant-based eating, I was 100% vegan for the last 18, 18 and a half years. Uh, the first five years of that, I ate a full spectrum of vegan. So I would eat lots of raw. Uh, I would do juice feeds and things throughout the, from year to year, multiple times throughout the year. But then I, I ate raw junk food vegan as well. So I had a mixture of things. And as I realized the, you know, felt the difference, I should say, then I just slowly cut back. So every year, um, uh, twice within a year, I would, when I come off a juice feast, I would, you know, take something bad out of the diet forever. And so I cut back. So probably after the first five years after that, then I cook foods, uh, less and less throughout the time there was steamed and boiled things. And then recently I've just been all raw. Um, we, we, um, in our restaurant, um, are looking at ways of manipulating foods because we, we work with a lot of our patients. So uh, I was talking to our chefs and we were going to start adding um, this uh, food pep technique called sous vide, uh, the high pressure cooking under moist conditions. And you can cook things like potatoes at low temperature for a longer period of time. So we're going to look at adding these types of things because what we're working on doing is creating uh, foods that, meet the criteria of raw from the standpoint of not being cooked at high temperatures, heated at low temperatures, and the sous vide allows us to do it even without dehydrating. So that in my food classification system, they have a higher classification than say a, a dehydrated food. So we're constantly looking at different ways of getting higher quality food. We're trying to break new ground in other ways. Uh, and uh, for instance, we have a, an excellent uh, raw vegan meatloaf. Uh, I had Chef India, who's out of Belize, come and work with us. Uh, and she came for a week and contracted her to come and work with us on our menu. And so we developed a delicious enchilada pie, uh, meatloaf. And I mentioned these things largely because the audience, you know, when people think of raw vegan, they think of just salad, salad, salad. And this whole area of gourmet raw is very helpful because, you know, uh, you know being that many of us were raised on the standard American diet, we have this, 
desire for the savory comfort type foods on our palate. And so when you're in raw, uh, you may be doing a detox, but let's say you want to come off a detox, you come off the juice feast, you come off the, you know, salad feast or whatever, you don't want to go all the way back to cook. So then maybe there's something that's in between. And so the gourmet raw with these like meat loaf is heated up to 130 degrees. We have a spotted rice. Uh, my chefs came up with a delicious gravy. So this coming Thanksgiving is going to have like a meat loaf and gravy. We do have a mushroom that's marinated, uh, dehydrated, uh, a cranberry relish, and a number of other things. So uh, we'll probably add sous vide uh, to the technique. And so some of our traditionally cooked items may be prepared sous vide at low temperature. So, so we're working within that food classification system to bring things down. And so even though out of convenience, convenience, I use the term raw, it's, it's a label that can be a little bit confusing because some foods are heated to a certain extent. There's some raw vegans who don't heat, have no dehydrated foods, some who have a lot. And so there are different spectrums, even within what we call raw. That's really interesting. I, um, I have, uh, yeah, I wrote the raw diet was a huge part of my cancer healing journey. And, um, and I eat a whole food plant-based diet now and raw and cooked food. And, um, is the main reason why you gravitate toward mostly raw or all raw? Is it mainly the preservation of enzymes? Is that a big factor for you? Or is it the keeping the moisture rich food state? It's a great question. So I try to deal with these things conceptually and, and uh, Colin Camaro's book whole and talks about how we have this reductionist look in nutrition. And of course, you know, we're reductionists in a lot of ways, medicine and, and the like. Um, and, you know, reading this book, you know, I started thinking about things and then you say, okay, if we, you know, have this nutrient that we put in a vitamin capsule, uh, and say, well, okay, this nutrient, this vitamin capsule, we, we discovered that this nutrient in this vegetable or this plant, rather, it has X benefit. We, we figure that out. So then we take this nutrient, isolate it, put it in this capsule. Uh, is the nutrient in the capsule the same as the nutrient in the plant? And I argue not because, and, and that's Colin Campbell's argument because you, know, you look at food as a center. It's, it's, it works very well. And so, okay, that's fair. So then now you say, okay, let's look at the whole food. And so I've heard, you know, whole food plant-based doctors are signed to say, well, if you look at carrots, uh, a cooked carrots, you know, have certain nutrients that are more available in the cooked carrot than in the raw carrot. Uh, um, and so I said, okay, that's fine. But then if these nutrients in the cooked carrot are more available in the cooked carrot than the raw carrot, then the question is, what other nutrients in the carrot are less available? You know, and then I say, what other nutrients, known and unknown, are less available? And that's the question you can't answer. Because <laughs> there's an assumption that when you cook the carrot, and maybe there's more beta carotene in the cooked carrot than in the raw carrot, then that cooked carrot is better. But then I say, okay, that's fine. Just because there's more beta carotene in the cooked carrot than the raw carrot doesn't mean that cooked carrot is better. Because it's all like you say, go back to the symphony analogy. You say, okay, you got the beautiful symphony and you have the trombones, you got the, you know, the flutes and the, the string. And let's say you go and, and um, you, you, you knock off all the, the flute players and, and knock off all the uh, tuba players, you hit the trombones a little better. So you say, okay, so I went and manipulated this, this orchestra, the trombones are, are, are louder now. I can hear them better. Does that mean the orchestra is better? No, you, you got rid of some other instruments that helps beautify the music. So just because you hear one you know, instrument better than the other doesn't mean the whole music or composition is better. And the same thing with the food. Just because when you cook a food and one nutrient is more available doesn't mean the whole food composition is better. Thank you. That's a great answer. And it is true. There, I mean, there is, a, there is some science on, on this topic that right? Showing some nutrients are more bioavailable when they're cooked, but you definitely are losing others, right? You're losing some minerals or you're definitely killing enzymes. And there are certain chemical reaction, reactions like in like sulforaphane in cruciferous vegetables that if you cook broccoli and then eat it, you get no sulforaphane, right? That's exactly right. Uh, that, was so, only, that was the sulforaphane thing was only a recent 
you know, finding yeah. and a lot of people who are promoting cooked vegetables started to say, well, you can have some raw vegetables now. Well, I mean, there are many other nutrients that are in these foods that are raw we've yet to discover. And so my, my argument, someone that said, okay, what's the ideal diet? The ideal diet, if, if, if now again, let's throw practicality and everything out the window. Let's just say, okay, the ideal diet. The ideal diet is if I can go in my backyard and go somewhere and I get on hands and knees and I can start grazing in the grass. If I got spinach growing, I, I, stoop, I eat the spinach while it's still, roots are still in the soil. I climb the tree and eat the fruit while it's still hanging. That's the ideal diet. Now, I'm not saying that's the most practical way of doing it, but what I'm saying is that let's start there, and even though we can't be there all the time, maybe you can have a garden in your backyard, and maybe you can't from time to time go and browse in there and eat just for the purpose of principle. But the point is that you want to eat food as close to its natural state as possible. That's the point of that statement. And so the 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 the, the further away we are from that, then the more compromised our food is. So once you pluck the fruit off of the bush or the tree, it starts to oxidize and eat it. That doesn't mean it's bad for you. I'm just saying that that there's an ideal, the most ideal, and there's something less than the most ideal. So we just need to keep that in perspective when we talk about food and when we're talking about, thinking about healing. So, so these things may be okay once your body's healed. Yeah, you can have a certain amount of cooked food. You can have a certain amount. Your body is healed. But when you get into an acute illness, then you need to go back to ideal. And the thing that I'm, I've been recently uh, thinking about more, because you have people that promote the carnivore diets and the, the various other diets. And so, well, you know, you know, they get some good results. I mean, it's not like, you know, you, you, know, uh, you know, all carnivore diet for a week and you drop dead. I mean, people eat a carnivore diet and they get better. So why? Why is it, are people getting better? Large because they're removing something bad from the diet. They're removing processed foods. And so they say, well, then some people on the vegan diet are not doing so well. So why are they not doing so well on the vegan diet? Because they have processed foods. So there is a common denominator of processed foods, whether it's an animal processed food or a non-animal processed food. So that's the other you know, thought process is that even though we eat plant foods, even raw, I mentioned a lot of raw foods that are processed, dehydrates and the other. So other detox techniques I'm working on for our patients is getting them back to the place where, okay, you're only eating whole foods. Now, if you don't you have poor dentition, your GI tract's messed up, yeah, we're going to have to smoothie them, we're going to have to juice press and so on for better absorption. My heart failure patient, I have to give them smoothies and juices to decrease cardiac output contribution from a uh, breakdown of food. That's understood. And that's why I give my level zero foods a higher classification than even my raw cooked foods. But still, I'm looking at the concept of putting people on like mono meals or tossing meals, uh, which is a higher classification in our system for the simplicity of eating food as close to the natural state as possible with minimal to no processing. That's great. I love it. I, I had the same same revelation in my own health when I just, you know, I, I remember thinking I need to eat and live as close to nature as possible. Yeah. And at one point it's like, do I need to move out into the wilderness, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to sur to survive, you know, don't need to move and then start sleeping outside. You know, I didn't, I didn't take it to that level, but I was thinking about it. I was prepared yes. to go there. Right. But yes. Yeah. But, but, but no, to, to, the, to, to follow up to that point, it's, you know, even again, we're, we're, we're um, creating a balance between practicality and, and optimal health. Yes. And so when we think of, okay, this is something that's optimal from a conceptual standpoint, but here's where I am right now. What I want people to understand is that even though you can't get here, understand where the optimal level is and, and try to do things to move in that direction. We're not saying, okay, maybe you can't eat 100% raw for whatever reason, but move in that direction. Maybe you can't live outdoors. You're in the city, you got a job, you got a family, et cetera but figure out how you can go do nature walks from time to time and increase your doses of nature walks, increase the dose of nature walks and just laying out in the park somewhere and laying out in the wooded area for a couple hours a week or a couple hours a month and then a couple hours a week, et cetera. So this is a matter of understanding where, where ideal is, understanding where you are, and then saying, okay, one, I have the mindset of I can 
move in that direction. Don't be, you know, uh, pessimistic. There's no way I can go and live in the wild. And it, okay, you can't live in the wild, but can you expose yourself to the wild? So you want to understand, say, here's ideal. What steps do I need to take to work in that direction? That's, that's what I try to convey people to do. That's great. And most people have a lot of room for improvement. And that's, that's a good thing, right? It's that's like, right. there's so much you can do. Right. And this is my big message to cancer patients in my community. It's like, there's so much you can do to help yourself, right? right? You're empowered. You don't realize it until you start learning and listening to, to professionals like yourself and other people who've healed. There's so much you can do to help yourself. And it, it'll never, your life and your diet and your routine will never be perfect. That's right. But progress is the goal and and by changing your daily routine eating a plant-based diet eating lots of raw foods exercising getting fresh air and sunshine spending time in nature forgiving people who've hurt you right letting go of the past all those things are so wonderful right yep yep and you know when you clean your system out biochemically and physiologically it helps you do a lot of those things you know if you're putting trash in your system that could be physical food trash are looking at you know trash on TV or trash on social media. When you're feeding your body this negative trash, uh, it 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 impairs your ability to do the things you mentioned. Now, granted, you know forgiving people, etc. It may take other steps, but once you start to heal and the pain and most, then it opens up the 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 avenues to allow you to take those extra steps. But you know you you can't medicate yourself with poison. Uh, and so, so that's certainly why I like the, the natural uh, nutritional approach uh, to be the first step because it gives you some definitive progress, the definitive things you can do, uh, and, and, and it's, it's the most direct way to get you on that path toward healing uh, in many different ways. And it's a big lever that you can pull because anybody, what I like to say is there's a lot of things in your life you can change and some are easy and some are hard, but anybody can change their diet overnight. That's right. That's right. right? It, it takes time to forgive. It takes time to, to move or change jobs, right? That's right. That That's stuff right. takes time. It takes time to change the way you think and break your bad attitude, mental habits, but you can change your diet overnight and you can start That's exercising right. most people immediately and, and right. you get big benefits right away from that. So um, I just thank you so much for your time. Th I love what you're doing. Uh, and how can people connect with you? So we will put links in the show notes and below the video and all that too. But uh, where can people find you? They can find us at MontgomeryHeart.com. Uh, that's my main website. And um, we have a lot of things coming up. We have a new doctor series coming up. Uh, it's the heart and soul of a champion. And it talks about uh, our interventions. So heart and soul of a champion is one of our interventions where we take individuals with advanced diseases and we put them on a nutritional detox diet with time restricted eating, sauna therapy, and all of these things. And we take them out and exercise them. And as you mentioned earlier, you may not be able to exercise right away, but we get people with bad arthritis and we start them from where they are in the wheelchair. Once they start detoxing, we walk them and they do lunges and next thing we're out running heels. So it shows the insights of all of that. So Heart and Soul of the Champion, be on the lookout for that. Uh, but MontgomeryHeart.com is uh, a website, and that's the best way to start. We have online coaching uh, classes, and, uh, and we, uh, you may have all that, the links of that in the note. And um, we have an upcoming gala um, in, in the, uh, this year, in October 20th, where we'll have showings of the documentary um, even after the gala. So MontgomeryHeart.com, that's the main hub. You can get a number where we are and, and reach out from there. And, and uh, and the rest I'm sure you have in the show notes. That's terrific. Thank you again, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. I, I, I'm so thankful for you. I'm grateful for you. I'm so glad that you exist and that you're doing this incredible work and helping people actually restore their health. It's so important. And I hope this inspires um, my audience uh, that they can take control of their life and their health and also inspires other practitioners and physicians uh, and that'll reach out to you and hopefully connect and, and start their own wellness journey and maybe even completely uh, transform the way that they practice medicine too. So uh, I, I just love interviewing plant-based MDs and diet and lifestyle practitioners. It's so great. So thanks for watching everybody. Have a great day. Please like and share this video, share it with people you care about. This information is amazing. It's, it's life-saving, life-changing, and uh, we got to reach more people. Thank great. you, Dr. Thanks. Montgomery. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor.